everybody, everybody, you with strong inspirations. You got Anthony Brogdon, and I'm ready to go this morning. Let me tell you something. I didn't sleep well last night thinking about this interview I got right here. This man going to blow your mind. He was on the channel before I got on. He was so ready to go. This is what we do as Strong Inspirations. You know I'm Anthony Brogdon, and I do my very best to find the people who know this good Black history. And then what I do is I let them tell the story. I just ask a couple questions. Matter of fact, I ain't going to let you. I, I, my, my friends, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I, I, I know what they're going to talk about, but I don't really do any research in advance so I can act like I got no clue. For those of you who got no clue, I ask the kind of questions for people who got no clue so that we can get a clue. You see what I'm saying? And so what I'm asking you to do is a few things for me. I would really like it if you subscribe to the channel. We don't get no information. All you do is hit the subscribe button. And then you kind of like a part of the family even closer. I really want you to like this video because my man gonna tell you something that's gonna blow your mind. Watch out. I really want you to hit the notifications bell because then you get a ding, you get notified because I'm putting four or five videos up a week. This thing has, this train is moving. <clears throat> it's gaining momentum for sure. And I would like for you to tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself thinking you want to, don't let nobody know where you getting all this good information. All right, my brothers and sisters, please do that for me. The other thing I want you to do is, as you might know, I'm a filmmaker. I'm serious about my game. I love me some black history and I have been loving for a long time. This is my documentary, it's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. Slaves went to college, you didn't know that and I didn't know that. Because there were three HBCUs open before slavery even ended. One of them opened in 1837 almost 30 years before slavery ended. And I talk about that in my movie and it's streaming on Amazon. And then I wrote this book that accompanies the movie. The book is good. I'm telling you, I put, man, the book is real good. This gonna become a real bestseller. I self distributed and I uh, offer it through Amazon, but also on my website, businessintheblack.net. It's just like the movie, but it's got more facts. How about this? Madam C.J. Walker was not the first black woman or millionaire in the country. That's a tidbit for you. She was just flamboyant. It's in the book. And I uh, get you a copy of this. And then, you know, I have uh, got to tell you, my man's sitting there waiting. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, brother, just give me one more second. He's sitting there he looking good. One more second, my man. I use that word strong a lot. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And I got a strong man on the channel. Come on, brother, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's get it on. Thank you for being here. My name is Robert Bell. Most people call me Bob. I am a member of the 12th United States Colored Heavy Artillery. That was a actual Civil War regiment of African Americans that was formed at Camp Nelson in 1864. The unit that I am in began in December of 2001. <clears throat> now, Hold on, let me stop you right there. I, I, I do the same now and then, let me stop you. Where, where you live, how you get to be who you are to like to do this? Well, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. All right. The uh, Camp Nelson, of course, kind of following up on your podcast with Dr. McBride right. is in Desmond County, which is about 20 miles south of Lexington, Kentucky. Right. So for me, it's about a 90 mile drive from my home to Camp Nelson. OK. Uh, and you just like black history or somehow you want to do this? I started out with an interest 
in Black history, but more around the Buffalo Soldiers than the Civil War. Okay. Okay. I didn't get interested in the Civil War until I became a member of the 12th. Now, when I started reenacting, one of the first things I realized because of what our mission was, which is one of education. Okay. That I had to educate myself before I could educate anyone else. Okay, let me stop right there. When you say you got involved, you went down there, saw it, signed up and said, hey, I like the volunteers. It kind of like that? Well, not quite. Okay. It started back in 2000. Okay. I went to Washington, D.C. to see the Spirit of Freedom, which is the statue at the African-American Civil War Museum there in D.C. Oh, really? That's I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Yeah. That statue was done by a friend of mine by the name of Ed Hamill. Oh, really? Okay. So when I finally find the statue and I'm looking at it, looking at the memorial, there was a black woman who had come over from Germany. She was teaching school there and she was doing research on one of her ancestors who happened to have been from Kentucky. Okay. He was a soldier in uh, either the fifth or the sixth United States Colored Cavalry. He was born in Bourbon County. Now my roots go back to Scott County, Kentucky, which is close to Bourbon County. Okay. So when she said Bourbon County in Kentucky, there was a connection. I got you. Okay. When I got back from DC, Camp Nelson was doing a dedication to the fifth and sixth United States Colored Cavalry. Okay. So I decided I my wife and I we drove down to that dedication. Okay. Now what surprised me was the lack of people of color at that event. Okay. When I got there, there was my wife and myself. There was another couple that had a table set up. They were vendors right. selling some items. And then there were two men in uniform. Okay. And one of those was from Danville, Kentucky. His name is Jim Hunt. He told me they were trying to get a regiment farm there at Camp Nelson and asked if I would be interested. Really? Now, I'm thinking, okay, here's people trying to tell our story, right. our history, right? and we're not there. Yeah. So I told him that I would be interested. And what happened was Camp Nelson had received a grant to purchase a cannon to use as a static display. But a man by the name of Tom Fugit, who was over the Civil War sites in the state, convinced them to let him try to recruit at least eight African-American men that would form the 12th United States Colored Heavy Artillery. And we would learn how to fight, safely fire the cannon, that we would go around, do living history, uh, some reenactments so that we could educate people on Camp Nelson, but also on Kentucky's Black Civil War soldiers. Okay. And I've been doing it since 2001. Man, I love it. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, let's go back just a tad for the viewers. There were, let's say, three or four Black regiments of Black, now when I say Black regiments, let me say, of regiments of black men that fought in the Civil War. That's what this is about, right? Well, yes. Now, primarily, I'm talking about Kentucky. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got you there. Okay. I I, do, I tell people I am not a Civil War historian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't care who fought at Gettysburg, per se. Right. I don't know troop movements there or whatever. That doesn't interest me. I got you. What interests me is in the role that my ancestors, right. your ancestors, played during this time. Okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. The regiment that you in, where were they back in the day in real life? Where were they uh, uh, stationed? And do you know anything of what they did? Oh, yeah. The uh, 
We were organized in 1864 at Camp Nelson. At Camp Nelson. At Camp Nelson. All right. In October of 1864, the regiment was sent out into the field and it was divided up into basically three groups. Okay. Those three groups, their primary function was to, the way I like to explain it, we protected the railroads track that ran from Louisville to Bowling Green. So this is a north-south line and they were stationed at various points along that line to provide protection, not only for the railroad, but also to protect uh, enslaved people who were in the surrounding area. They okay. would gather them up, bring them to a central location for safety uh, as another way to in increase the number of African-American men that were in the various regiments. Okay. Uh, that was their main thing. Okay. The regiment itself never actually left the state of Kentucky. I got you. Let me ask you, was it, who, who was the head guy of the regiment? Do you know that one? Uh, they, the regimental commanders changed from time to time. Right. And they rotated headquarters. The headquarters would rotate every few months from Bowling Green, Kentucky to Mumfordville, Kentucky. Okay. So you would have different commanders with each of I got the you. battalions. I got you. Now, now, of course, the highest office we could hold would have been Sergeant Major. So, and that's the thing about it. Even then, even though it was a black regiment, they had to have a white guy or hold the highest office to, to kind of tell them where to go, what to do, that kind of thing. Well, all, all the officers would have been white. Now, you. it's interesting, there were some black officers. Okay. Uh, most of them were chaplains or recruiters, but we did have Major Martin Delaney, who was a ranking as a major, that is a military rank, yeah. uh, which is a field rank. So he's probably considered the highest black officer. I got you. Uh, he was not the first. Yeah. The uh, first Kansas had a black officer who was a recruiter. Now, what was interesting about him, his last name was Matthews. Okay. He applied for a commission to Washington, but he never heard anything. I got so you. So he got a little bit disgusted and decided that he was going to resign. While he was going to do that, they did respond to his request. Okay. And he was appointed an officer in the first Kansas. Okay. Let me so, ask you this. You said they protected the railroad. Is there uh, any known battles between them and, and the Confederate uh, along that, that that railroad that they had to, to and, they, and they beat them up real good or anything oh, like yeah. that? Yeah, not not so much battles, but skirmishes. These okay. would have been small battles. Okay. Uh, there was one where men from the 12th were captured by Confederates. The Confederates took them back to Union lines in E Town, Elizabethtown, Kentucky, turned them loose, paroled them, and of course, uh, the Confederates wanted a head start to get away from there. But the commander at, at Elizabethtown, he agreed to it, but then he immediately turned around and sent patrols out to try to capture them. There were battles uh, down around Horse Cave where mm -hmm. African-American men actually defeated them in skirmishes. Oh, uh, okay. One outside of Bowling Green. So there were a number of these small skirmishes where they would have repelled Confederate attacks. Now, I did hear that when the Confederates saw a black soldier, they didn't hold him up. They wanted to kill him. They, you know, they 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 couldn't just take him as a prisoner or something like that with the white guys. They they were more vicious towards the blacks. Had you heard that story? There is some truth to that. There is, uh, if, if you start looking at that, it kind of goes both ways. Okay. Uh, particularly after the battle and massacre at Fort Pillow, 
because remember Fort Pillow became one of the United States colored troops battle cries. Okay, so hold on, let me stop you there. You know that story? Oh yeah. What happened there? Yeah, let's tell that one. Yeah, I like it. Uh, 1864, and, and I like to tell it this way. Bedford Forrest and his cavalry invaded Paducah, Kentucky. Okay, let me stop. Who is he and is that the Northern people or the, or the, or the Confederate? Confederate. The Confederate invaded Northern Kentucky. Uh, well, actually, southwestern Kentucky. Southwestern. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So they they invaded Paducah, and the Union garrison at Paducah abandoned the town, and they fell fell back to Fort Anderson. Okay. Forrest attacked the fort. Inside the fort were men of color of the 8th United States Colored Heavy Artillery. Okay. Some of these men had not even been mustered in. These were raw recruits, but they were assigned to man the artillery there. They're... So, so what you mean is they wasn't even taught how to shoot it and all that stuff, right? Well, you know that's about mean? all they knew, basically, yeah. was how to shoot. Okay. And how to aim, but they were so good the Forrest could not take the fort. Now he tried to get them to surrender about three times, but each time they drove him off. Forrest then retreats from southwestern Kentucky, goes down into Tennessee, and along the banks of the Mississippi, I'm going to say it's so probably 50 miles or so northeast of Memphis. Mm -hmm. Give you an idea of where this fort is located. Right. On the banks of the Mississippi River. Uh, the fort initially had been a Confederate fort. The Confederates had abandoned it and the Union Army occupied it. Okay. There were colored troops and white. The white was the infantry the colored was more or less uh, men from the six United States colored heavy artillery and maybe another heavy artillery unit I that was you. formed from men down in Tennessee, Mississippi, that area. Okay. They were stationed at the fort. I got you. When it came under attack, they had these raw white infantry men who were to protect the outer grounds of the fortifications. Okay. They got pushed back into the fort. Now, when you, if you view Fort Pillow, there's was basically only one way in and one way out. Okay. Now, even though they had artillery, the fort is elevated and there is a trench around the fort. I got you. So they could not point the artillery pieces low enough to fire down on the Confederates I once got they got inside the camp. Oh, so they got inside? Meant, yes, they got inside. Ooh. So for the men to either escape or surrender, to escape, you basically had to go down a sheer bank to the Mississippi River. I got you. No escape that way. I got you. Okay. So as they tried to surrender, the Confederates massacred. Okay. They bayoneted, they shot men. They just basically, uh, well, I'll say out of the African American men that were there, only about 65 survived the massacre. They were taken pris prisoner. One man by the name of Peter Williams. His descendant is also a member of our group, was taken prisoner, and his family didn't know where he was for over a year and a half. He was finally paroled uh, and made his way back to his family, but uh, his arm had been injured and he could no longer use one of his arms. Oh, man. So a uh, very interesting story. The men were thrown in mass graves uh, several different grave locations. And then finally they were, the mass grave was excavated, if you will. Yeah. They are reinterred in 
the National Cemetery in Memphis. You, you go back a little bit earlier. You said that there was one battle uh, where the uh, the black soldiers fought off uh, Fort Anderson, I think is what you said. Right. Uh, when, when, let me, let me, I like this part. When we win the battle, that means that we a good shot. We see you out in the woods over there. We shoot so good that we can get you at more than you can get us. So we, they, they was good shots. That, that, that's what that means, right? Well, it means that they were, I won't necessarily say good shots. It meant that when they retreated to Fort Anderson where they had artillery, right? They have now switched the battle. Okay, the battle becomes a different one. You've got cavalry and maybe some infantry going up against artillery in a fortified position. I got you. And of course, they would have had infantry there as well. So the odds of you winning go down. Now, you either have to have superior numbers or some other way to maybe outflank them to overcome the power of the artillery. And you got to remember with some of these artillery pieces, you're talking a range of over a mile. You can't shoot a rifle accurately from a mile away. I got you. But I don't have to be that accurate with an artillery piece. Okay, hold on. Let All me I got to do is I'm come close. To... What's an artillery piece? Is that a gun that shoots multiple rounds? What's an artillery piece? No, we're, we're talking cannons. Oh, can oh, okay. really? Okay. All right. Now, a good cannon crew could fire two to three rounds per minute, depending on the type of projectile. Okay, if, let me stop you there. When you say cannon, are you just talking about one of them long nozzles with a big ball coming out the end? Is that the cannon? Yes. Oh, okay. by, by and large, yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Now, they had a solid cannonball, which was called shot. They had what was known as shell, which was a hollow ball that had gunpowder in it and a fuse and it would explode when it got to the target. I got you. Throwing, I got you. throwing shrapnel. I then they you. had one called case shot. Case shot was a hollow ball that had lead, small lead or steel pellets inside it. Okay. Okay. Uh, and when it went off, it would also explode. Now you've got the shrapnel from the shell itself plus the balls that are inside it going into the enemy. I got you. Finally, we had one called canister. And what canister did was if you had a smooth barreled cannon, it turned it into a big shotgun, more or less. I got because you. When it was fired, it opened up and these big lead balls went out like buckshot, if you will, from a shotgun. I got you. So uh, the force of the artillery pieces was really the deciding factor. I got you, I got you. Now, let, let's say uh, in that instance, uh, let's say going to stay on the same fort, how many black guys might've been there? At, I don't actually know, but yeah. at this point in time, the regiment was not complete. So I don't know what the numbers would have been. Uh, a typical regiment is about a thousand men, but with some of the heavy artillery regiments, there may be as many as 1,500. I got uh, you. You know, when it's finally full. Uh, and now when they, when they get them guns down there, them cannons and things, they got to transport them by the train. Is that is that how they transport them? Uh, no. It, well, it would depend on the size of it. Okay. But you had artillery pieces that could be moved by horses or mules. Okay. 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 They would uh, they would connect to what's called a limber. Now the limber is an ammunition chest. It's a two wheel wagon, if you will. Okay. That connected to the cannon. Cannons also got wheels. So 
uh, you would have six horses or four mules that would move that artillery piece. I got you. Okay. I got uh, you. Now, some of your larger artillery pieces would have to be moved by train. I got you. So now you, you 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 do this. What what uh, I know, like you had to be kind of naive, just understanding is what 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 realistic today terms have you learned doing what you do about them back then that they were normal people. You know what I'm you know what I'm getting at. What what was your ha ha moment? doing what you do as, as a volunteer doing this you know what i mean the biggest thing is learning the impact that we had on the ward itself okay and then also the impact that those men had once they left the military and returned to their communities oh really okay see that's that part of the story sometimes gets missed these men returned home as heroes, okay? May not have gotten the recognition during their time in service, but when they went back to their communities, now people are recognizing them. You fought not for your own freedom, just your own freedom, but you fought for the freedom of all of us. You know, there, there are stories about women who would not marry men unless they had served in the united states color oh troops. really oh yeah. Oh, yeah yeah there are a few stories like that yeah. and the thinking in my mind is that if you didn't have enough guts to fight for my freedom yeah i don't want to marry you i got you i love yeah. it in, in in kentucky because kentucky was such this odd state during the war uh in louisville there was a man by the name of Thomas James who was with the uh, AME church. Uh -huh. He was put over the refugee camp that was located in Louisville, Kentucky. Hold on, let me start. When you say refugee, refugee means don't, what is that? Yeah, what, who, who's Ref the refugees? Refugees are the wives, the children, the older people of the African-American community who are trying to escape slavery. I got you, I got okay. you. Okay. But they have nowhere to go. I got you. Okay. The Emancipation Proclamation did not apply to Kentucky. So the only way these people got any sense of freedom was to either be kicked off their owner's property or they escape and they make it to union lines I where they you. can be protected. I got you, I got you, so, I got you. So you've got this huge group of African Americans in this camp uh, on the east end of Louisville, Kentucky. And Thomas James reported to a man by the name of General Palmer. Palmer was an abolitionist, totally against slavery. So one of the things that he did, he would tell James, go down to the refugee camp see if you can find a woman who is not free yet and marry her off to a soldier so that she could gain her freedom. Because in March of 1865, Congress had passed a bill that freed the families of the soldiers. So the wives and children were able to gain their freedom if their husband was a soldier. So he would, he would marry women off. Mm, just okay. to give them their freedom. Mm, okay, I like it. Uh, let, let me ask you this. When you're doing your uh, enactments, uh, how about this? This might be kind of funny. You see one of them white guys over there. Now, you're supposed to shoot up in the air. <laughs> but you say you get you get kind of caught up in the zone and accidentally hit him in the nose. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> it's, it's my it's bad. All, it's, it's all about safety. I know, I know. I, I, yeah. It's a funny and, joke. And there, there is a lot of respect between people on opposing sides, if you will. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, I have a number of friends that are basically Confederates. Now, they also do union, but... So they're white people. 
Yes. Yeah, they got to be white people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that's all right. Yeah, there's, I understand. I understand. There's a, there's a few of us that. Yeah, I understand. I like it. The what people don't understand about the reenactment community, more or less, is that there is a bond there between black and white, black and black, black and white. Yeah. You get to where you know everybody. Yeah. And we're all there really to learn. They learn from us, we learn from them. We, uh, the interesting story is that the first time we did a major event was in the fall of 2002, uh -huh. and we were reenacting the Battle of Perryville, which was the largest battle in Kentucky. Uh -huh. This was a national event, uh -huh. probably had some 10,000 reenactors. Oh, really? Yes. People had come as far away. One group we met came from Ireland. They came over here to take part in that reenactment. Really? We had never done a major event before. We had barely had tents, just getting organized. So our lieutenant, who happened to be the man who was over the Civil War sites in the state, he had been a reenactor with another group, white group, 4th Kentucky Infantry, CSA, Confederates. He arranged for us to camp with them so they could kind of show us the ropes. These guys know what they're doing. Now, here we are, eight black guys camped in the middle of the Confederate Army. Really? Really. And <laughs> it was one of the most enjoyable weekends we've spent out at a reenactment. Huh. We, we got to know one another. Uh, we, we appreciated them taking us in. They appreciated us being there. And it was really funny when spectators would come through because they'd look at us yeah. and they'd look around and they'd look at us again and we're sitting there laughing because yeah. we know what the question is. Right, what y'all doing here? <laughs> what y'all doing here? That's yeah, right, 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 right. So the story from us was we had captured the whole Confederate army. Yeah, yeah, right, I know, I know, I know, we, I know. We had a good laugh about it. Now, let me ask you this, as we kind of come to a close, when you do these, are they scripted though? You got to know, at the, you know at the beginning who's going to win, who's going to lose this yes. battle, don't you? Right, yeah. Yeah, there, there's basically a script. Yeah. Uh, and and that's kind of done, either it's a script, is scripted along the actual history of the battle. Yes. Or it's just, some, if it's not an actual battle that you're doing, yeah. you know, historical one, then the groups will determine what's going to happen, you know. So we're gonna let, let me ask you this, how about, I got another one. So you've been killed in these enactments. Have you been killed? Oh yeah, yeah. And so when, when you get killed, you just say, okay, I, I got 10 minutes before I get killed because of the timing. And then they accidentally look like they shooting at you and you fall dead because nothing happened. You don't get hit with nothing. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. You, the, the, the script was in some cases, they may say, draw straws to say, okay, if you got this color straw, the short straw, you're going to die at a certain point. I got you. I got okay. you. Uh, I got you. It, it pretty much in our case, one of the battles we do where I do die yeah. or have died yeah, yeah. is when they overrun our position. I got you. Okay. So let, 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 I got one more funny one. So your wife is sitting there and she's watching you and she's like, go honey, go honey. Don't let them kill you and that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I got to go though. No, no uh, <laughs> spectators, uh, spectators are not really that close. Uh, oh, okay. You have to keep them safe as well. Oh. And, and okay. so 
where they may be where they can actually see what's going on. I got you. There's enough noise on the battlefield that you don't hear the spectrum. Yeah, it's not like she's on running the sidelines saying, no, you know, no, no. yeah, go Robert, go. He won no. over there, or that kind of thing. I got you. Well, hey, I, I, is there a question that I have not asked you that, you know, uh, that comes to mind about this uh, per se? Or? Well, I, I had initially thought about talking about a man by the name of Elijah P. Mars. Okay. Uh, we got five minutes. Can you do it? Yeah. Okay, Real let's quick. do it. Let's get him Mars in. escaped slavery from Shelbyville, Kentucky, Simpsonville. He led 27 other African-American men to Louisville to enlist in the Union Army. He rose to the rank of sergeant because he was educated. He knew how to read and write when he enlisted. But after the war is the important part. Mars became a school teacher. He became a minister. There is a HBCU in Louisville called Simmons College. Yeah, familiar with it. Elijah P. Mars was the founder and first president of that college. Boy, I, I heard of the school. Yeah. So yeah. he also was instrumental in founding uh, about three churches yeah. in the Louisville area. Those churches are also still in existence today. I love so, it. So people don't really understand the total impact that these men had once they got back home. I got you. I got you. Hey, well, I, I show sure glad we got that one in too. Uh, and so on and so forth. And, and I'm, I, I really appreciate you taking time to come on here and tell us this story. Because what, what you do, and when we hear these stories, is you put a, a humanistic angle to it. It's just back in the day. It's, it's back in the day, but once I put on the blue suit and I step onto the field, I'm back in the day. And it's humanistic, but it's also personal. Does because, it make you cry? Do you cry at any point during this? You know what I mean? Uh, there have been times when I felt like it. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I take it seriously. And you'll find, uh, and I'll say for African-American reenactors, we take it seriously because we want our story to be told and to be told right. And this is, this is from me. Yeah. A white man cannot tell my story. Yes. Because he has not been through what I've been through. Yes. So it's personal. I got you. Yeah. Everybody, this is what we do with Strong Inspirations. I find these people somehow, some way to tell it like it is. And we give it to you straight, no chaser. Boom, shaka laka. <laughs> Man, I'm so happy the guy came on the channel. Everybody, you hit that subscribe button. You hit that like button on this video. Hit the notifications bell. Tell somebody about Strong Inspirations. And to you, my brother, I say with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, doing them enactments. I'm coming to see one of them and I'm rooting for you. So give me one where you live. <laughs> Cause I'm coming down there. We're going to, we're going to get some people to come down there. This is what we're going to do here. Strong inspiration. Watch out people. I got some stuff for you. I got some big plans. September the virus the is over. I got big plans. We're going to do some things. We're going to come down here and see this brother right here and see some of them enactments. Um, again, I thank you for being on the channel. Everybody, thank you for watching it. Uh, we're going to say bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. We out.